Hi and welcome back to Build a CubeSet. I'm Manuel and today we are finishing our read-through of the CubeSet standard document. In case you haven't seen the first video, I highly recommend checking that out first, so this will make a lot more sense. You will find a link to the video and to this document in the description. Alright, let's look at some electrical specs. So last time we left off talking about deployment switches and separation mechanisms, which is a good segue into the electrical specs, I think we left off on page 14, yeah. So the whole idea is um, that the CubeSat needs to be electrically fully inert from the moment you hand it off for integration to the moment it gets deployed on orbit. This is mainly achieved through um, two safety mechanisms. The first one is a remove before flight feature, which often has one of these red tags on larger devices. On a CubeSat, it's um, just a tiny little jumper, or uh, yeah, basically a jumper that we would uh, either remove or apply before flight. Actually, not you, but the people integrating the CubeSat. The other one is the deployment switch, which is actually actually just a small, um, normally closed, uh, momentary switch which is integrated into the end of the rails. I think there need to be at least two of those, but that is dependent on the, on the spec of the launch provider. So there might need to be more. The way they work is that they're simply, you know, depressed, you know, pushed in as long as the CubeSat is in the dispenser. And once it gets released, the, the switch releases and the electrical power is activated and the CubeSat is allowed to boot up. So looking at the document now, um, we see that the CubeSat power system should be at the, in a power off state from the time of delivery to the launch vehicle through on orbit deployment, which includes all power system, including all battery assemblies and solar cells. That is, yeah, it needs to be fully inert basically. But there are two exceptions to this. You may have a powered on battery protection system and you may have a real time clock running that's down here. Oh, I, I misspoke earlier. There need to be at least one deployment switch, but uh, I think most uh, launch providers will require you to integrate more. So this here deals with the working of the deployment switch, which is as we have stated before. Oh yeah, also important to know, you, you need to be able to toggle the deployment switch. So um, the first thing that happens after the deployment switch gets released is power is restored and the boot and the CubeSat is allowed to boot up, but you are not allowed yet to um, release any deployables or activate RF communications. So there are, you have to build in timers for these two things and for, I, I think, for testing, um, when you toggle the deployment switch, these timers, of course, need to reset. Now concerning the real-time clock that may be permitted, uh, in case you don't know, real-time clock is just a tiny little oscillator that gets used in a variety of devices, basically a device that needs to keep track of time or dates. So your phone is certain to have an RTC um, side note here. Of course, most more complex devices will ask a server, a time server on the internet for the exact time. But simpler devices like, you know, your oven or some other device uh, will definitely use a real time clock. Also cameras do, of course, because most of them don't have an always on um, internet connection. And of course, we would like our CubeSat to have an RTC. So, you know, just in case we need to timestamp data it sends back or we want to have it sending back data only in certain um, time windows, things like this. There are some specs for the RTC, uh, less than 320 kilohertz, and it should be, it should draw no more than 10 milliamps. Yeah, so that's for this. Everything else needs to be powered off. 
Then there is a bit about umbilical connectors, um, which is uh, a fancy word for saying cables that may need to go to your CubeSat. I imagine that is I imagine that is for charging the CubeSat while it's um, prior to integration, and they all should be located on one side of the CubeSat, which may, which makes sense because. Um, some deployers, not all of them, have a hatch on one side where the, which you can open and access all the CubeSats. So it makes sense that every connector you might you may need to access uh, is on the same side on every CubeSat. Um, side note here, not all dispensers have this. So this is also something to consider for the remove before flight feature. Um, it may be necessary to um, remove this feature before integrating the CubeSat into the dispenser or uh, it, it, the, the scenario may be that somebody opens up the dispenser and then removes the RBF feature. Um, so we kind of need to take this into account uh, when designing the, these, these, these processes. Um, yeah, this actually it says it here that we need to think of this when you design the power on and boot up sequence. And of course, as with every protrusion, also the RBF may uh, only protrude um, 6.5 millimeters max from the surface of the rails. So the next thing that I find kind of obvious is that the CubeSat shall have a battery protection system for charging and discharging to avoid unbalanced cell conditions. Um, so not, not every battery is created equally and chances are that you have more than one in your CubeSat. So it may be that uh, some charge faster than others or discharge faster than others. And if you charge all of them equally, some may get over, overcharged basically. They may have a critically high voltage or a critically low voltage after repeated charging and discharging cycles. And the battery management and protection system kind of um, balances these, these cells out against each other. That is something that a lot of devices employ, so it's kind of obvious to do this in a CubeSat as well. Also, um, if you want to make your life a bit simpler, um, only use uh, UL listed batteries that are not modified, modified or customized in any way, which we'll definitely want to do. Now there is a part about inhibits. As I said before, I think um, the RF system and deployables do not, are not allowed to activate right after deployment. There is a certain um, time that needs to pass in order for the CubeSat to gain some distance from the vehicle deploying it, of course. And the, for the RF system, there should be at least uh, three independent inhibits. Um, and for deployables, there should also be three, at least, independent inhibits. So a inhibit is a physical device between the power source and the hazard. And the timers uh, are, are not considered inhibits. Um, this is something I would like to uh, look into a bit more because I'm not sure what constitutes as a physical device in that case. Does it have to be like a relay or would a, a MOSFET be enough? So yeah, that should go on the list of things that I need to investigate a bit further. So in this chapter about operational specs, we get a first glance at uh, regulations we need to follow. And of course, radio frequency regulations is a large part of this. Obviously, we need to obtain uh, the proper licenses for the radio frequency bands we want to use. And depending on which bands that is, um, the, you have to talk to different uh, entities. Uh, I would like to use uh, amateur radio frequency bands, so I have to talk to the IARU, which is the International Amateur Radio Union. Um, I think you, you can just apply there and uh, you then have to show that you have, uh, you have coordinated with them for your project. Then you also need uh, to obtain a license from the country where you reside or where the company is that operates the CubeSat. 
So here the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, um, can help apparently. Uh, we will check out their websites and the resources in the f resources in a future video um, because I think that is there's kind of a rat's tail or yeah there's multiple steps to this licensing process. Um, I fear it's not as easy as it is made out to be here, but we'll see. Of course, we also have to comply with orbital debris regulations for which a document is referenced here. Um, this is kind of a very important and also kind of complex field. So this will deserve a, its own video at some point in the future. But in general, I think if we don't do anything crazy material wise, we should be fine. Um, we had a look at the, at the selection of aluminum alloys that are usually used for CubeSats. So if we stick to them, I, may, I think we should be okay. Also, what wasn't mentioned actually in this, in this uh, spec are the, the fasteners, the bolts. That's just a quick side note here. I think um, stainless steel is pretty, pretty common to use um, as a fastener material but we will probably have to show that we don't use excessive amounts of stainless steel in our uh, cube set because it would, you know, re-enter with a higher, with more energy than aluminum parts. Next, we get some information about the deployment sequence for a cube set, which uh, basically happens in three stages. So first, the deployment switch is actuate when the cube set is ejected out of, of the dispenser. And at this point, it is allowed to activate the power system and basically boot up, which is stated here in this note. Um, but we are not allowed to immediately deploy stuff or turn off the RF system. So we will have to wait 30 minutes uh, after deployment to deploy, to actuate any deployables. So, um, you know, solar panels, antennas, that kind of stuff. Then another 15 minutes after this, we are allowed to um, turn, on, turn on the RF system. And at this point, we basically enter into, you know, regular operational mode and we can start transmitting the beacon through the RF system, which would um, allow us to locate and identify our CubeSat. It seems pretty straightforward, but I think to, uh, to design and um, engineer this in a very robust way will be extremely important. So the next chapter is all about testing and as I think I said in the intro the first video of this too, I, I will need to learn more about this before I can, I can talk about it. But basically the three steps we'll have to deal with is random vibration where the cube set gets put, gets uh, bolted onto a large vibrating table which can generate very accurate um, vibration patterns, patterns and mention the structure's response to this, basically verifying that it won't shake apart when it's vibrated uh, violently. Then the TVAC bake-out, um, that's basically just a large-ish vacuum chamber where, um, the, where all the atmosphere is pumped out and uh, the cubes that get heated repeatedly and or cooled um, to make sure that, uh, you know, it meets the, the outgassing criteria. And also the visual inspection, according to the CIFP, that's the checklist we have um, looked at in the first video, which I will also link again in the description. But yeah, as I said before, this, this is a, testing is a hugely important um, part of the CubeSat project, so I will want to learn more about this. After this, we get some, I think, yeah, some information about CubeSat dispensers, which are, which are not that important for us right now. Let me just um, turn on the colors for a moment. So, yeah, well, it's still a bit wonky. I will switch to light mode, so protect your eyes if you need to. <laughs> Um, here you basically see how a dispenser works. It's, you know, mechanically kind of straightforward. You have a rectangular, rectangular tube with a large spring and a pusher plate. Here we see the access port on one side and you basically just load cube sets in there. 
lock the lock the door and uh, yeah pops your uncle you're ready to <laughs> deploy i'm sure it's it's more it's more complicated than this but you know the the principle is pretty easy to understand all right um i will switch back here so the details about the dispensers that are available do not really directly concern us for the moment that will be very re relevant in the future when we um, try to pick a launch provider. There is some, yeah, just some contact info and I think this is it for the moment. Let me check my notes. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's it. I know this was kind of a lot and uh, maybe not everything may make sense or may seem too relevant for the moment, but I, I felt it was really important to go through this um, step by step and in some detail so we are kind of on the same page uh, as, we, as we start this project. So yeah, uh, thank you much for watching. I hope this was useful for you. Let me know if you like this video and I will see you in the next one.